Okay, so what we're gonna do today is work through uh, the materials I posted for the sixth lab set. Basically, the purpose of this lab is just to go over how you can alter the, um, the GLM code to fit the other two binomial GLMs that we discussed in lecture set number six. I'm also gonna spend some time just showing you how I extracted different values from the output. We did a little bit of this last class as well. I, I our last lab as well, I kind of very quickly touched on the likelihood computation and how you can extract that value from the AIC. But I'll go over a couple of these points again today. Uh, I'll show you how I went about computing a few different things there. When you're extracting information, there isn't really a right or a one way that you can do it. Uh, it's just you can work with the, the, the summary data however you want. Um, and uh, I will also discuss the computation of um, the residual values. I'm going to talk a little bit about the residual plots that are available to us and what to consider when you're working with those plots. I'm going to talk about the um, dispersion parameter as well and how we can use the dispersion parameter to adjust our output. And then I'll just show you the differences. And then at the end of it, I'll just touch on how we can fit that multinomial model. Um, in doing that, I'll also introduce um, the rel level function. So this is uh, this is a function that you can use to set the um, or to reset the reference level for categorical variables. And we actually need this in order to get the output from our model to match the output that was given in the lecture set. In terms of the final predictive ability of the model, it doesn't make a difference if you set it or not, set the reference levels or not. But for um, consistency with what's posted in the lecture sets, I want to show you how you would have to adjust the code in order to match things up. All right, so we're just going to work with that beetle mortality data, data again, just consistency with data set. We don't need to go over what the data set involves because we've seen it on a few different occasions now. So we've learned how to fit the logistic regression model. Um, I'll just very briefly show that. So here is our code to fit the logistic regression models. The key parts here are the formulation of the response variable. So we have C bind, number of successes, number of failures, right? So very important to keep in mind that this is the expected input for the response variable for any binomial GLM. And then this is a function of the explanatory variables. In this case, we only have one explanatory variable, but you can easily put in a range of explanatory variables in this model. And we're, you'll see an example of that on question three of assignment number three, when we use it for prediction of tumor status. All right, so we have our family being specified as binomial. Over the coming weeks, we're gonna start switching up the family type and learning how to um, work with different types of GLMs, but for now we're still using binomial, but we'll consider different model types within the binomial framework. And here is our output for this model. We discussed the coefficient interpretation last lab. We discussed the definitions of the null deviance and the residual deviance. Uh, and we discussed the definition of the AIC. We've done this in lab and lecture. At the top of the output, we have the five number summary of the deviance residuals. I'll show you how to compute those today. It's very easy. It's done via the residuals command. And we can confirm those values um, using the definition of the residual as well. Okay. So if we want to fit the other two, um, binomial GLMs, we have to make a very small adjustment to the code. So starting with the probit model, all we have to do is change the definition of the link function within the uh, GLM code. So you can see here, all I've done is said binomial link equals probit. And we can do the same thing for the complementary log log model. So here we have C log log. All right. And that small adaptation will change the model that's fit. So uh, we'll keep in mind a couple of the parameter estimates here. So we had negative 60 and 34. If we fit the probit model, 
you can see that we now have negative 34 and 19, right? And then if we fit the C log log model, you can see that we now have negative 39 and 22, right? So just to illustrate that we are um, working with a different model, a different binomial GLM after this adaptation. Um, it's maybe not that it's not a big deal, but it's worth pointing out that we specify the link, but this is actually the name of the model where the link in the probit case is actually the inverse of the, um, the CDF for the Gaussian distribution. And the link here, I believe is the extreme tolerance function. So these aren't actually link functions, they're model names, but uh, we specify it as link equals in the GLM code. In terms of interpretation of the output, everything is exactly the same. The only difference, of course, is the response variable is no longer the logit in the case of the complementary log log function, and it's not the logit in the case of the probit model as well. So while the outline and how we use the majority of the values are identical, so for example, this Z score and P value here are evaluating a linear relationship between X and the response of interest, so G of the pi hat in this case, uh, the interpretation of this value will be different because the link function is no longer the um, logit. All right, but otherwise our interpretation will be identical to, or will work in the same way that we discussed before. We just have to keep in mind that this response is no longer the logit. And if we want to extract information from this model, for example, make predictions, compute fitted values, this can be done in the exact same way we discussed in lecture set five using the predict and fitted. Um, the predict and fitted functions. Okay, so I'm going to talk about computation of some diagnostic measures now. Okay. And I'll use um, the C log log function as my illustrative function for this demonstration. But the alteration to the code in order to say extract the likelihood value or compute the BIC for the other models would have the would be done in the exact same way the only difference is you would have to change the model name okay so for example um let's say that we wanted to extract the likelihood value we can do this using the um aic okay so what we can do here is First off, if we type names res.c log log, this tells us all the different quantities that are available to us within the summary output for this particular model. And you'll notice here we have AIC. So So res c log log dollar sign AIC, that gives us the AIC for the complementary log log value. Okay, so the AIC is equal to negative two times the log likelihood plus two times P. So basically we just need to solve, we just need to rearrange and solve for the likelihood in order to get that value out of the um, AIC quantity. So by rearranging this, we're gonna end up with the log likelihood is equal to AIC minus two P divided by negative two. So we can apply that very easily in R as follows. You'll notice here that I am wrapping the expression in brackets all that does is force R to print the result automatically. So for example, if I don't wrap it, oh, C log log. So if I don't wrap it, it doesn't print anything, but it's stored in L. If I wrap the value, it'll just automatically print it. Okay. And that can be useful depending on the application of interest. If you need this value for a report, it prints it quicker, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, all right. So we can, if we want to compute the um, pseudo r squared function,
in the uh, textbook, like so the way that we've been doing this, we've been using the adjusted log likelihood value to compute this quantity. So in order to adjust the log likelihood value in the case of the Beatles data, we need to add the constant that represents the sum of the log of the combinations term in from the binomial likelihood function or from the binomial log likelihood function. This quantity is equal to negative 167.5203. And we discussed um, how the uh, output for, well, basically the output for the model utilizes this quantity, but the calculations that, I've, that we've been utilizing in the textbook do not. So in order to be consistent with the chapters and that I've been using for the lecture notes, we have to um, account for this quantity. So in order to do that, we can take our computation from above and we can just adjust it by adding that combination term. So this can be done as follows. Ironically, if this adjustment is applied to everything, I don't think you actually need it in the calculation of the pseudo R squared, but we can easily check that afterwards. Okay, so this is gonna be the adjusted log likelihood uh, for the model of interest. Okay, and now what we need to do is compute the same, the log likelihood value for the null model. So we're gonna fit the null model now to this data set. So to do that, okay. So to do that, we're gonna take the same code we had before. So GLM, but we're just gonna make the response a function of one. We have the same link function in the same data set, and I'm just going to call this CLL.null. And then based off of this, I can compute the log likelihood for the model. This is going to be done using the same adjustment that I discussed above. The only difference here is that we only have one model parameter. So instead of having two times where the P now is equal to one in this adjustment, whereas before it was equal to two because we had a slope and an intercept term. Okay, so that gives us the null value for the model. And then the pseudo R squared is going to be computed using the definition given in class. So we have the log likelihood for the null minus the log likelihood divided by the log likelihood for the null. And that gives us 0 0.954, which seems very high. There we go. That's the correct value. Okay, there we go. 0 0.4349. I'm pretty sure though, if we just drop this term, we can get the same value, which might simplify things going forward. Uh, no, we can't. You have to maintain the adjustment. Yeah, so we have to make that adjustment um, in order to compute that pseudo R squared. So for any of the binomial models that you fit, you'll have to compute the, um, the sum of the log of the combination term. I'll show you how to do that too, just for consistency. Uh, that would be N underscore I choose y underscore i. Okay, so this is what we're learning how to compute. Okay, so we're going to have basically minus sum log. And then from our data set, we're going to take the number of observations per term and the number of successes per term. So then we're going to have choose um, Beatles dot data dollar sign n comma, Beatles dot data dollar sign y. Okay, so that's how you would compute this value. So it, in a situation like the one on um, assignment number three, question number two, when we're applying the same type of model to a different data set, when we want to compute things, if we wanted to compute something like the pseudo R squared, we would have to make this adjustment. Um, I don't think there's a pseudo R squared question in part two, but there is one in part three. So we would have to make a similar adjustment in that case as well.
actually, well, it's worth going through it, but in that situation, because the data is Bernoulli, that adjustment will be zero. So that's actually an interesting little caveat for Bernoulli data. So that'll be interesting to explore, to explore on the assignment. Um, and we'll see if we can discuss that at a later point once people start working on the assignment. Okay, um, so that's the pseudo R squared value. So, uh, any questions? We talked about another type of R squared value as well. Uh, this is based off of the deviance measures. In this case, we don't actually need to fit the null model, though you could compute this value using the deviance from the null model as well, because the, R, the, um, the null deviance is automatically returned to us from the original output. So here what we have is, I'll call this R squared D. Okay, this value is equal to one minus the exponent of the deviance minus the null deviance. Okay. Divided by let's push this down one minus the exponent of the negative null deviance. Oh, that's not correct. Oh, uh, and then this expo inside the exponent term, this value has to be divided by the sample size, the total sample size, which is 481 for this problem. There we go, 0 0.991. Does this also output a value? Oh, you can shorten it. That's cool. Hmm, that's neat. Okay, so that's the R squared D. Okay, and then the last value I want to talk about was the BIC. So the BIC is just a further penalty to the log likelihood based off of the number of observations. So in this situation, um, what we can do is take the, law, the likelihood value that we computed before and basically just penalize it based off of the, um, the BIC penalty. So here, what we're gonna have is negative two times L, uh, the original L value shown here. So I just need to refit that times L plus, and then we're gonna add the penalty, which is the number of parameters. I should write this down, though it's given is equal to negative two times log likelihood plus uh, P times log N. All right, uh, so here we'll have negative two 
times the likelihood plus two times log. Uh, it doesn't matter as long as you're consistent, but here I'm putting N as the total sample size. I think it would also be, it's also fine to put N as the number of observations in the data set. So you could also write it as eight. As long as you're consistent with using this penalty across the different models, you'll be able to compare them. Okay, so 481 is a much stricter, uh, is a more strict penalty than eight would be. Okay, so that gives us the BIC for the model. All right, uh, the other one other value we talked about in class was the x squared statistic, so the Pearson x square or Pearson chi square. So to compute this value, we'll talk about the residual computation next. Okay. All right, so there are two major types of residuals that are utilized um, for our uh, binomial GLMs. They are the deviance residuals and the um, the chi square or the x squared chi squared residuals. Both of these can easily be extracted from. I'm just going to put this under residual analysis. So both of these can be easily extracted using the residual function. So residuals of C log log is automatically going to uh, pump out the residual values. So here are the eight deviance residuals for the fitted complementary log log function. So the default residual type are the deviance residuals. All right. Now we should be able to verify the output from the C log log function. So we have the five number summary shown above. So if we type summary residuals res.c log log, yeah, you can see that basically all this five values here are just the output from the summary function for the residuals, because this again is just a five number summary. So we can extract that information or verify that information just using the summary function of the residuals. If we want to extract the Pearson residuals, we have to specify residual type. So inside the function, we would type residual Pearson. And this will give us the Pearson residuals for the um, fitted model. Okay, so from the Pearson residuals, we can compute the X square value. So this is gonna be the sum. I'll save these, so these will be div.res and these will be peer.res. And these will be Pearson residuals. Okay, so here we're gonna have the sum of the Pearson residuals squared. Okay, and you can see for this model that gives us 3.294694. Okay, so that's our X squared value for um, the fitted model. All right, we can also easily perform a residual analysis for our models using the plot function. So this is actually consistent with how it's done for the, um, uh, the normal regression model as well. Okay. So if we top type plots, res model, you can see that it's going to pop up the same set of models that we had in the linear regression case. So the first is a residual versus predicted value um, output. So what's interesting about this, first off, is that these residual values are the Pearson values. Okay, so these use the Pearson residuals. The second thing that's interesting is the predicted values are the values of the um, response g of slash pi. So you'll notice here, like we have predicted values that are ranging from negative, let's say two and a half to positive two, which 
in originally when I was reviewing these, I I was a bit confused because I thought, okay, well, everything should be on a scale, like on a positive scale, because we're at, we're talking about probabilities between zero and one, or we're talking about the log of the odds, which should be positive as well. And then I realized what's happening here is it's plotting residuals versus the direct output from the model. So if we type predict res c log log, oh, sorry, I have to close this out. So if we type predict res c log log, these are the values that are being utilized in the, um, the residual plot here. Okay, so this is plotting Pearson residuals versus the direct predicted value. So the value of the link of pi for the particular model. All right, also within the residual plot, so I'll just reset it so that you can um, see how it clicks through. So this is the first plot. Our second plot is a QQ plot. So this is the standardized Pearson residual, which we talked about the definition of in class. So that's just the Pearson residual div um, divided by I think I believe it's their standard deviation times one minus their value from the hat matrix. So by their leverage, essentially they're standardized by their leverage against the quantiles of the normal. And the idea is that given the sample sizes are large enough, the these residuals should be normal or standard normally distributed. So we would expect this plot to give us um, the, it's, the, the residuals should form a linear pattern with the quantiles of the normal distribution. Right, the next plot is our the square root of the standardized residuals versus the predicted values. Uh, so this is our scale location plot. I believe with this plot, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure what this plot is supposed to be utilized for. I haven't figured it out yet, um, but it is included in the R summary. So it's something that I should look into at some point. But the other plot that typically would be interested of interest to us is the residuals versus leverage plot. So again, we have the standardized Pearson residual. We have their uh, leverage given on the x-axis, and then we have a marker for the Cook's distance. And we know that any value that exceeds a Cook's distance of one can be considered influential. So in this particular case, we don't have any observations that are getting above a Cook's distance of 0 0.5. So there isn't evidence of any um, influential points in this data set and we don't we do have a point that appears to be fairly low leverage shown here okay so this would be well this would be a point that's low leverage compared to the to the mean of the rest of the values okay. so a number of useful plots uh, can or residual analysis can be easily done for these models in the same way it was done for the linear model simply through evaluating the residual plots that are given to us um, via R. All right. And we can also compute the X squared value using the Pearson residuals. Okay. okay so that's uh, all I, oh, over dispersion. Any questions so far? All right, so we talked about the definition of overdispersion in class uh, yesterday. And the idea is when the residual deviance is much larger than the degrees of freedom, this could be evidence of overdispersion. Vice versa, I think you could make the argument that if this is less than the residual deviance, it could be evidence of underdispersion, but typically we're not as concerned with under dispersion as we are with over dispersion. So over dispersion, from what I've read in the literature seems to be an issue that is um, more concerning than under dispersion. So this, this residual value here is giving us no evidence to suggest that the Maxwell model is required. And it's also smaller than the um, given degrees of freedom um, for the fitted model. Ideally, these values would be very similar, but in the case that the residual deviance is less than the number of residuals or the degree of freedom, we could, I guess, also correct 
the value, uh, correct our output for um, under for un, under dispersion. Okay, so basically the way that this is going to work, given what we've studied in class, is we're going to compute a dispersion parameter called phi. And if phi is greater than one, that's evidence of over dispersion. And then we'll say if phi is less than one, it's evidence of under dispersion, which I think is a fairly reasonable conclusion. So if we, if we have a value that's less or greater than one, we have evidence of dispersion in either direction, and then we can adjust our summary output for um, that for, for the presence of dispersion, which will most likely always be there because I think it's very unlikely you're going to get a value really close to one. Okay, so to do this, we've already learned how to compute x squared. So we talked about the computation of this value uh, using the Pearson residuals. Okay, so we need x squared. And the phi value is simply x squared divided by the residual degrees of freedom, which is n minus p. So in our case, n minus p is going to be the number of observations, and p is going to be the number of model parameters. So if we divide by n minus p, our dispersion parameter will be 0 0.549, okay, right? So this follows because the residual deviance is less than the degrees of freedom. So we're saying there's evidence of under dispersion here. And now what we can do is we can adjust the output using the summary command. So we say summary res.c log log, and then we say dispersion equals phi. And now if we compare the output here, so first off, you'll notice the estimates don't change, right? So these estimated, uh, the parameter estimates are exactly the same, but the standard errors and the corresponding Z scores do change. So these have been scaled down because the dispersion parameter is less than one. So you can see we have a smaller standard error here, which is resulting in a higher uh, Z score here, which results in a more significant p-value indicating a stronger relationship. So the idea is we have these ideas of over and under dispersion. I had mentioned before that we seem to be more concerned with over dispersion. When you adjust the output for under dispersion, if the model parameters were already significant, they are going to be more significant now, which is probably why in the literature this adjustment isn't required because if the model is under dispersed, but the parameter estimates are showing a significant relationship with the response, adjusting them to show a more significant relationship isn't providing any additional information. But if the model is over dispersed, this adjustment would potentially reduce the effect or this adjustment could result in the response and the predictor not having a linear relationship. Okay, so for example, to highlight this point, suppose we use uh, the logit model. So here we have a much higher uh, residual deviance compared to the degrees of freedom. So this would indicate over dispersion. Let me just. Okay, so what we are going to have here is x2 dot logit is going to be the sum of the residuals of res dot log type equals Pearson. Do I need to capitalize that? No type equals Pearson squared. Okay, and then this is gonna be divided by N minus P, which will be the same. Okay, 
right? So this is showing evidence of overdispersion, though it's not, I wouldn't really say significant, but I, I shouldn't use words like significance because we're not testing this against a particular distribution. Okay, so let's say that we adjust the output now. Okay. So if we consider the original output, here's our standard errors. Now what's going to happen is these things are going to scale up, which could affect the significance because you're going to be dividing the estimate by a bigger value. Okay, so you see now we are at 6.69, 3.765 compared to 5.18 and 2.12. So now our Z scores are in the area of nine, negative nine and nine, but these are still very significant. But you can see how the the Z score has dropped, which would increase tail area, which could technically lead to a, um, a non-significant linear relationship, right? So again, over dispersion could reveal, adjusting for over dispersion could reveal a, a linear relationship between the link and the predictor that isn't actually significant. Whereas under dispersion would never reveal that because you're scaling the standard errors down. Uh, any questions? Okay, um, the last topic is fitting the nominal logistic regression model. Okay, so we actually had just gotten to the start of our illustration in, in lecture yesterday. So um, we're gonna talk about interpretation of the model tomorrow and evaluation of the model tomorrow um, when we return to that exercise. And then following that, we'll talk about an example where we fit an ordinal logistic regression model of which there are many different kinds. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is to show you how we would produce the output that's shown in lecture so that you have an idea of how to fit these models because there is a question on assignment three that requires you to fit the model. And then once fitted, uh, you'll have some sense of how to actually interpret the parameter estimates and work with the output. One thing to keep in mind is that Working with the output from this model and adjusting it to fit into how I'm displaying the results in lecture is again, not sort of like a one-to-one -one reproduction. There's a lot of little twists and turns that take place in order to reproduce the values. And I'm gonna talk about that when we return to lab after the reading week, um, but we will get through those model types after reading week and introduce the Poisson model uh, shortly thereafter. Okay, so we're gonna use the Dobson library. So this is where the data set is contained. So this is where the data cars is contained, which is the preference cats, which is the preference data set that we're working with in our um, lecture set. All right, and then to fit a nominal regression model, we're gonna use the um, package or the function multinome. from the package nnet. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is predict um, which category the observations are gonna fall into based off of their gender or their sex, sorry, and their age. The frequency is just telling us the number of persons that belong to each category. So this is saying there's 26 women aged 18 to 23 that responded no slash little importance to the question about how valuable are these car features to you. There are 12 women aged 18 to 23 that responded it's important and seven women that responded in that age group that responded it's very important. Okay. And then it's the same um, description working down the data set, right? So like eight men between 18 and 23, 40 men between 18 and 23 said no slash little importance to the features that were 
um, being presented in these particular cards, which I think were something like air conditioning and something else. Maybe like heated seats or something like this. Okay, uh, sorry, be right back. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so fitting the model, the, the nominal logistic regression model is actually no different from than fitting any other model. So for example, let's suppose that we wanna fit the response variable as a function of the, the sex and the age. So the, the, the normal way of doing that would just be to specify um, response as a function of sex plus age, data equals cars, weights equal frequency. Okay. And then if you do that, it, it gives you your output. Pretty straightforward. Now, the residual deviance and the AIC are going to be consistent. And when we talk about predicted quantities, so if you were to use predict or fitted on this model, this would also be consistent regardless of how you set up the factors here. However, what's happening in this particular situation is that men is being set as the default level. So the men is the reference level for the sex indicator variable. And age greater than 40 is the reference level for the um, age indicator variable. In lecture, the reference levels that I'm using are um, women and age 18 to 23. The other thing is that the reference level for the response variable is important. And I would like it to be set up such that the reference level, reference level is no slash little importance. So to do this, we can adjust the reference levels within our function, okay? So this is gonna be done using the function rev level. And this is gonna work as follows, okay? So we're gonna have the function rel level. You tell it the factor of interest. Okay, so this is gonna be the response variable. Notice that I have to specify cars within, um, within this function because um, otherwise it won't know where response is coming from because, or this rev level function won't know what response is without specifying it. And then what I can say is say, let the reference be no slash little. And then I want this to be a function of, and I'm going to do the same thing for the other values. Okay, so this is going to be my sex variable. This is going to be the age variable. Here, I'm now gonna change the reference level to women. And here, I'm gonna change the reference level to 18 to 23. Okay. And then I'm gonna have weights equal. All right, and then if I fit this model, Do I still have to give it this? Oh, that's bizarre. Oh yeah, because it doesn't know if I did, yeah, right. So I could do it like that. There we go. Okay. Now, if we were to type uh, summary res.cars, oh, sorry, let me make that a little bit clearer. This output is a mess. Okay, so if, now if we were to type summary res.cars, sorry, I can't make this any um, smaller, just given the variable names. You could change the variable names outside the function, that would help. So. Given this reparameterization, if you compare the intercept terms here and the standard error terms here, these will now match exactly to what we were given um, in the lecture output. So our interpretation of these values will be consistent with what we discuss in lecture tomorrow. But again, if you compare 
just the default, the residual deviances here and here, or the residual deviance in AIC shown here are exactly the same as those for this model. And if we were to use this model for prediction, you would see that those models are the same as well. So just for comparison's sake, let's call this like default, default model. So if we did prediction of this, or sorry, let's do fitted. It's a little bit easier to compare. So if we do the fitted values of this, this is the probability that each observation belongs to that particular group. Okay. And if we do this for the restructured model, you can see that the probabilities don't change. It's just the order in which they are presented has changed. Okay. So if you don't specify the defaults, it doesn't actually make a difference in terms of what you get out of the model. So you're going to have the same model in terms of um, predicted outcomes, and you'll have the same model in terms of residual deviance and AIC. It is the same model. But what it will change is interpretation of the model because you have to make sure that you know what the reference levels are for the, the categorical variables that you are interested in. And as you will see tomorrow, that is important because the odds ratio is interpreted with respect to the reference level. So if you don't have the correct reference level either defined or you haven't been able to identify it correctly, that, will, that could lead to issues with interpretation. Okay. Um, any questions? All right. So if there's no questions, um, I'll stop with the teaching aspect of lab here for today. Um, just a reminder that we have lecture tomorrow. Um, we'll go over the two types of logistic regression models for um, categorical variables that have more than two outcomes. And um, following that, we'll go into our reading week. And then when we reconvene after reading week, we'll start, hopefully we'll start discussing the Poisson GLM and then move on to other types of GLMs for the last month of the course. Uh, so if you guys have any questions for me, I'll hang around until the end of the lab period. And otherwise, I will uh, speak with you tomorrow.